Whenever you take a short driving trip in Scotland, there is always plenty to see. Scotland is famous for its beautiful sights and scenery, but the last thing you would expect is to be thrown into a world of the paranormal, to be the focal point in one of Scotland's most disturbing and mysterious abduction stories. When aliens came to Edinburgh, the A70 incident. We have quite a lot to cover, so let's just dive straight into the story. On the 17th of August, 1992, two men were driving along the A70 road from Edinburgh to Tarbrax at around 10pm. The driver of the vehicle was a Mr Gary Wood, a 33-year-old ambulance technician. The passenger was his friend, 25-year-old Colin Wright. The pair were heading out of Edinburgh, along the A70. They were going to deliver a satellite system to their friend, who lived about 40 minutes away in Tarbrax, which is a small village in East Lanarkshire. It was on this journey that the lives of these two men would change forever. When the car passed the Harper Rig Reservoir, about nine miles from their destination, the pair noticed a strange, dark object in the sky. It didn't resemble any aircraft known to the men, and there were no lights upon the craft. Gary later reported, when the craft was first seen, they were driving around 40 miles per hour, and that there was very little traffic on the road. As the craft began to move in the direction of the pair, they observed that it appeared to have three parts to it. The first was a rounded underside, then a roughly 30 foot diameter disc followed by a rounded top. It was said that the exterior of the craft was smooth, metallic and reflective. It also appeared to be windowless. As the craft drew ever closer to the pair, they began to panic. Gary remembers using an elbow to lock the car door and trying to accelerate away from the craft. The aerial object not only caught up with the car in mere seconds, but passed it. Now in front of the pair, the unknown craft produced a silver curtain of light that bridged the road in front of them. Going too fast to stop and having no method of evading this unfathomable wall of light, the pair entered the shimmering mist and were encapsulated within its sparkling radiation. Within the light, darkness overcame the pair. The next thing Gary remembered was standing outside in the pitch black he couldn't see anything around him. It was as if he was standing in a black void. There was no sign of the road, the car, or Colin. It rushed through his mind that this was death, the end of his life, that he would now be trapped forever in a black nothingness. But suddenly, the blinding light returned, as if from nowhere, and he had returned to the vehicle, now manically struggling to control the car. Fighting with the wheel, Gary was able to pull the car back under his control. With a glance to his left, he saw Colin had also returned. As the car came to a stop, both men sat for a moment. Totally out of breath, they looked at each other. The men would later describe that this is the moment they could tell, just from each other's eyes, that they had both undergone the same unworldly event, although they still had no concept of what had just occurred. The craft was nowhere to be seen, and the shimmering curtain had vanished from existence. After gathering their thoughts and having time to process what the pair believed to have saw that night, they set off once more for Tarbrax, filled with an uncertain anxiety. Finally reaching their destination, Gary stopped the car and went to unbuckle his seatbelt, only to find that it was no longer clipped in. Gary was certain that the belt had been clipped in at the beginning of the journey, but the night was only to get stranger. The pair unloaded the equipment from the car, and Gary went to knock at the door. Strangely, no one answered. He continued to knock with increasing panic and impatience. A light was turned on from inside, and eventually his friend came to the door, with a tired and frankly bemused expression. 
Gary told him he had the satellite gear and Colin was taking it up to the house. His friend, looking even more puzzled, asked Gary why he was here so late. Gary now began to question his sanity. For the life of him, he thought it couldn't be past 10.30 or 11. The man in the door told him it was closer to 1am. Not believing this, Gary asked for proof, which was quickly shown to him. Gary and Colin entered the house and explained to the friend the extraordinary tale of the craft, the barrier of light, the darkness, everything. It now seemed as if both Gary and Colin had lost multiple hours of time with no knowledge or explanation. They stayed with the friend until the early hours of the morning, discussing and attempting to explain this otherworldly scenario. As dawn began to break, they left Tarbrax and returned to Edinburgh, but this time they took the longer A71 road back to the city, not daring a second chance encounter with the craft. Four years later, in 1996, Gary would give a short account of what happened that night on the STV show The Mysterious North. With me is Malcolm Robinson, one of the country's foremost paranormal researchers, and Gary Wood, who believes he was himself abducted. Now Gary, tell me, what happened? Hey, well, me and my friend Colin Wright, we were uh, travelling, heading towards a place called Tarbrax from uh, Ox Gangs to there, it's a half hour drive. I was looking at this object, just floating about 20 feet above the road. How, how big was this object? Well, I measured the road afterwards, the road was 22 feet wide. The object must have been about 30 odd feet wide. So it was huge? It was fairly big in size. Um, when seeing the object, in my mind, it didn't conform to any like, helicopter or any vehicle I've seen before. It was just a, a craft of some sort, and then for some reason I just got really frightened, really scared. Um, Not surprised. Um, and what, what happened? As I went underneath the object, the craft emitted like a shimmering curtain, like a beamy, some light, and then everything went black. And I wasn't in the car, I couldn't see Colin, I'm standing up, I'm looking about in like just blackness, looking about, this went on about. 10, 15 seconds, and I thought, again, am I dead? And then what happened after that? After the... Then, after that, I'm in the car, and the car, the back end of the car is fronting out, and it's heading right across the road up towards the embankment. So, so you had went into a skid, and then, I mean, how long did all that take? Initially, I thought it took 15 seconds, the time for I entered, saw the craft, going into it, this, like, blackness with the shimmering curtain and that, and then, on the road again. When I got to my destination, I actually got there about quarter to one in the morning. So that was like two hours after well, you I know left. Odds, I'm no particularly, absolutely certain on the exact time. During the days following their strange experience, both men would become extremely lethargic and suffer from terrible insomnia. When they would eventually fall asleep, they would be cursed with the most intense and horrific nightmares. All of these symptoms would lead the pair to seek medical advice. Gary visited his doctor and told him about the headaches, the nightmares, the insomnia. The doctors gave Gary a rigorous examination, but found no signs of apparent illness or injury and knew of no medical reason for his strange ailments. Gary was sent for a magnetic resonance imaging scan, or MRI, to evaluate the cause of his headaches. No cerebral abnormalities were discovered. As a last resort, he was sent for a lumbar puncture, sometimes referred to as a spinal tap. Lumbar punctures are used to diagnose some serious infections, brain or spinal cancer, and disorders of the central nervous system. This invasive and frankly uncomfortable procedure was negative in all accounts, Still, they were no closer to a diagnosis. The pair began to do some research of their own into unknown aerial phenomena in the hope that they could uncover or demystify their troubling run-in with the strange craft. Neither of them reported the incident to the local authorities as they feared the ridicule and exposure that would come with this type of confession. At this time, they would also not discuss their story with the media. They did, however, send a report 
to the British UFO Research Association. Gary became more and more engrossed in UFO research and the paranormal. It was during this time that he discovered the Strange Phenomena Investigations, or SPI, which is an association of paranormal investigators, led by a Mr. Malcolm Robertson, who has published many books on UFOlogy. It was through this organisation that Gary would discuss his and Colin's strange encounter with the unidentified flying object. Gary was then contacted by Mr. Robertson, who had taken a personal interest in the case. It was him who would first suggest hypnotic regression to Gary and Colin. The pair were both sceptical at first to the idea of hypnosis, but later decided that they were out of options, and agreed to the controversial therapy. The hypnotic regression was to be completed under the supervision of SPI's resident psychic and hypnotherapist, Helen Walters. The sessions proved to be a catalyst for an even more unbelievable and dark tale. The tale of what truly occurred to the men that night. During the early sessions, not much was found. Both men stated that they could see vague images and sense distant memories but nothing concrete. In one of these early sessions, Gary broke down emotionally and ended the session in fits of tears. Something dark and ominous had re-entered his mind, but what? As the sessions continued, a much more solid picture of events began to form. Both men could now remember being within a car after passing through the curtain of light. The car had stopped in the middle of the road, and six small humanoid creatures were surrounding it, three upon each side. Gary recalls being in agonising abdominal pain, as if his stomach was being torn apart before he blacked out again. He was quoted during one of these sessions to say, you know if you've been electrocuted, your muscles all cramp up and it's really painful, you can't let go. It was like that. Colin, on the other hand, remembered seeing Gary outside of the vehicle, flanked by the strange entities. To his recollection, Gary was laying on some form of stretcher or carrier. The carrier was levitating, with no support from the creatures. It moved with Gary towards the craft. Colin's memory then turns blank, and he recalls the remaining events in hazy and confusing images, which seem to jump from scene to scene. He remembers walking into the dazzlingly bright craft, being led, as it were, by one of the humanoids. He was in a circular corridor and entered what he said was a distinctive room. Strangely, he described the room as almost featureless. It had a corrugated looking, transparent roof, which a soft light was filtering through. The room was empty apart from a singular, strange chair of an odd curved shape. Collins stated that the chair looked organic in its structure. He was then stripped naked and placed in the chair. He did not resist in any way and felt as if almost intoxicated. The chair, as he recalled, began to recline. He was then subjected to a non-intrusive physical scan. Then Colin felt a sharp pain in his right eye, followed by an intense burning sensation, some object or instrument was inserted, then removed from his eye. The next memory Colin had was when he awakened, contained within a transparent, almost glass-like receptacle. He was held in place by restraints at his feet and ankles. Looking out into the room from his crystalline prison, he could make out a number of identical cells, all with prisoners unclothed, some male, some female. The space between the transparent capsules was filled with a light mist that moved and swirled in a manner Colin would compare to dry ice. Standing within the mist were a new group of strange humanoids, similar to the others which he had seen, but these were much taller. The creatures were staring at him with huge eyes. There were four of the creatures in the room, one stood by the entrance 
and the rest began to move towards Colin's cell. As the beings got closer to the container, the glass began to frost, and within seconds was completely opaque. Now fully obscured from the creatures, Colin began to weep and cry. He had no idea what was happening, where he was, and what those things could be. An angular device suddenly entered the cell. It rose from the floor and in front of him spread out. There were two flashing red lights at the ends of the device, which now began moving up and down while circling Colin. The device appeared to be scanning him, but for what purpose? He was unsure. Gary did not seem quite as susceptible to the hypnotic regression as Colin to begin with, but as the sessions continued, Gary's memory and recall showed drastic improvement. Gary described laying with his back upon some kind of table. His clothes were removed and he was restrained. The room was similar to that which Colin described earlier. One key difference was a large, strange lens object, which was in the centre of the room. The object had extraordinary properties, and would twist and fold in itself in a seemingly infinite loop. Gary suggested that it reminded him of a Mobius strip or fractal. Emitting from the object was an omnipresent panning sound, similar to white noise. It was at this moment Gary's attention was suddenly drawn to the long, thin, semi-translucent arm outstretched over his chest. As the cold, alien fingers lowered slowly onto Gary's shoulder, he was torn from his hypnotic state, screaming as his convulsing body fell to the floor. As you can imagine, this was quite traumatic. It took some time before he returned to the hypnosis sessions, but returned he would, and with another incomprehensible memory. Gary recalls standing in a large empty room, when a hole opened in the floor in front of him. It was filled with a viscous gel-like liquid. Next to the pool, a three-foot column raised from the metallic floor. A segment of the column extended and rose further from the main body, until it reached eye level with Gary. At the tip of the column were two glowing red dots. It was at this time Gary would hear the sound of something mechanical beginning to operate. It spun up like an electric motor. The pool at his feet began to vibrate, and up from it clawed a tall, yet deathly thin creature. As its frail looking body emerged, Gary could sense it was in a great deal of pain. To him it seemed that this emaciated creature was just thin translucent skin held over an alien skeleton. Later on, Gary would learn that the pool was a form of medical treatment for the creatures, who struggle with the strength of earth gravity and atmospheric pressure. The being from the pool looked with indifference at the stunned Scotsman, then left the room. Gary felt compelled to follow the risen creature, and it led him to another large room, but this one was populated with between 30 or 40 other beings. From Gary's recollection, the majority of the entities within the room were tall, pale grey creatures, but there were some notable exceptions. One in particular looked human, described as a small, middle-aged man, dressed in a black business suit. Others were the smaller grey creatures from outside by the car, and finally small beings with odd heart-shaped faces which were covered with markings that Gary suggested were reminiscent of Native American tribal markings. As he stood and scanned his surroundings, trying to comprehend the near hallucinogenic scene before his eyes, he thought to himself, why are you doing all of this? Curiously, the question was answered in his mind, but only by one word. Sanctuary. Gary, in shock with the telepathic communication, didn't move. The voice within his mind continued. In many ways, your kind are more advanced than us. But you have been capped. Our existence is much like your own. We too have concerns and needs. While the creature was talking, Gary could feel the telepathic link between them. He could see fragments of another life within his mind. The life of the creature. 
This connection seemed to pass information between both parties. It was from this that Gary gained a greater understanding of what the being had said. Humanity had been capped, an interference in the evolution and development of our species. Psychologically and physically, humanity had been repressed. The aim of this repression was to decrease the threat that humanity posed to the other life forms in the universe. Humanity and its rapid development were seen as too immature to handle the responsibility of the power we had created. During another session, Gary recalled being underground. He remembers sitting in a large cave-like chamber, with multiple tunnels leading off in every direction. In the cave was another craft, similar to the one he had seen on the road. Underneath the craft was three of the tall thin beings, and at their feet was a young naked woman, curled into the fetal position. She had been crying, and was clearly in some state of distress. Gary felt that she was another abductee, and was also a prisoner of the unearthly creatures. He recalls thinking that he could definitely identify her if they were to meet up again. This was one of the last regression attempts made by the pair. Helen Walters, the hypnotist slash psychic, commented that after the multiple sessions of regressive therapy, that she fully believed what the men were saying, and that they were entirely sincere and she truly thought that they had been abducted by an alien species that night. Gary went on to become deeply involved in the Scottish paranormal scene, and continued his research into UFOs and abductions. Eventually, Gary created his own small research group, and would work with Scottish paranormal author Ron Halliday. Colin, on the other hand, went off in entirely the opposite direction. He wants nothing to do with the UFOs, the supernatural, or his old friend. He has not commented on the alleged abduction in a very, very long time. Let's now take a more critical view of this abduction. The first thing that made me suspicious of this alien craft encounter was that running alongside the A70 road between Edinburgh and Tarbrax is the Kirk Newton Royal Air Force Base. It is less than three miles from the Harper Rig Reservoir, where the men first saw the craft. Which leads me to suggest that the pair could have seen a military aircraft, or even an experimental or prototype aircraft. But the major issue with this story is the hypnotic regression, which has been refuted by science many, many times, and quite successfully at that. If you want to know more about this, I will put some links in the description. There was also a six month period between the incident on the road and the first hypnosis session. During this time, both men made statements that they had been researching and reading about UFOs and alien abductions. This would be prime information to be recalled during the controversial therapy. Not to mention the therapist and her links with paranormal investigations and a group that profits from Scottish paranormal stories in the form of Malcolm Robertson's books. I am not suggesting that there was malevolent intent, but there are definite ethical issues and questions with how the therapy was handled. I think the information gained from the regression therapy is unreliable at best, even if it does make for a wonderful and enthralling story. Now, I am not saying that the incident did not occur, or that the men were lying just that the regression cannot be used as evidence of their encounter. What is evidence of their encounter, or at least evidence something interesting may have occurred that night, was that reports from the British Ministry of Defence were released, which suggested that the government had had an active investigation into the incident, and that in 1994, two years after the incident occurred, an official report was filed by the Ministry of Defence the explanation they gave was that it could have been American military testing, which was occurring at the Kirk Newton RAF base. But what actually happened, we may never know. But we will continue to search. Thank you for listening.